band here with us. Uh, uh, Brian again on, on uh, keyboards. Evelyn Gilpin is here on vocals. Rick Hesse on bass guitar. Eric Brotherton on uh, guitar. And Mike Vaughn on drums. Also, a big thank you to uh, Noel Brown and Scott Gibson, who are our tech wizards today. Uh, a couple of quick things as we get started. We invite you to, to like and love and comment in the, the uh, comment section below the live feed today uh, so, that we're know that, so that we know that you're, you're there watching us and so that we can kind of come together and be community uh, today. And uh, also, uh, want to invite you on Wednesday nights to come out uh, or to tune in, rather, at 6.30, we pre premiere the Bible study. And on, uh, for that Bible study, I kind of go verse by verse into the text that I'm going to be preaching on uh, the next weekend. And uh, so, for instance, uh, this past week, we looked at uh, chapter 21 of Revelation. And we went through it verse by verse. And I shared a lot of stuff with you that probably doesn't make it into the sermon, just for length. Uh, purposes. And so if you want to go back and listen to that later, you, you can. We would uh, love for you to, to do that. And at this time, we're going to begin, gather the kids around, because we're going to begin with a children's moment by our uh, youth pastor, Janelle Quinlan. Have you ever wanted to read the end of a book just to see how the story ends? Would it change how you react to the story if you already knew how it would end? Well, I have great news. We already know how the story of this world ends. The Bible tells us in Revelation that God wins. And since we know that God wins, we can live our life without worry, doubt, or fear. Let's start living like he has already won right now. We can do that by showing God's love through our actions and our words. We can pray together. We can forgive because we've been forgiven. And we can celebrate Jesus' victory. Let's make our lives such a celebration of God's victory that people are drawn to follow. Let's pray. God, we are so thankful that we have you in our life as our author and we know that you win thank you for letting us know in your word that we don't ever have to worry because you are in control show us how we can demonstrate your love in such a way that more people want to know you in jesus name we pray amen Thank you. 
pray together this morning. Loving God, we thank you that you are present with us, God, wherever we are, that you walk with us wherever we are, and that you are good. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who blesses us with good and gracious things, such rich, rich and wonderful blessings, God, that you are the God who comes into this world with your loving kingdom, that you have brought heaven to earth to meet us here in all of our mess, all of our sin. You have come with your gift of love and goodness. You are so good we thank you, Lord, that you do come and you meet us here and you bless us with your presence and your spirit. Meet us, Lord, now, wherever we are, wherever we are, Lord, bless us with your um, your great love now. It's in your holy name we pray, amen.
C.S. Lewis once wrote in his book called Mere Christianity these words. He wrote, Christianity asserts that every individual human being is going to live forever, and this must be either true or false. Now, there are a good many things which would not be worth bothering about if I were going to live only 70 years, but which I had better bother about very seriously if I'm going to live forever. C.S. Lewis got it. If we live forever, and that's a, a central tenet of our faith, then it's something we should be thinking about. And that's what we've been doing now for the last couple of weeks. We've been exploring the theme, eternity is now in session. As I was thinking about this theme uh, this week, another C.S. Lewis book came to mind. And that book is called The Great Divorce, which I, I, it's been years ago I read. It's one, of, it's one of his fictional books similar to the Screwtape Letters or the Chronicles of Narnia, which is, uh, you may be familiar with. And for a long time, I'd heard about the book The Great Divorce, but I avoided reading it, mainly because of the title. I think it's kind of an unfortunate title. Later, I learned that that is actually a literary reference to the division or the divorce between heaven and hell. That's where it comes from. So basically, the book tells the story about a, a group of people who live in hell, and, and it's, hell is pictured as this big, gray, lifeless city. And once a week, anyone living there has an opportunity to get on a bus and go to heaven. And anyone can stay in heaven if they choose. So that's kind of the setup. When the bus riders finally arrive in heaven, everything is more real and more substantial than in hell, and, and, and certainly more beautiful. Uh, the, these residents from hell discover that they're almost vapor-like. They look like ghosts compared to everything that has substance in heaven. It hurts, hurts them to even walk on the grass in heaven. And each of the people that, that go are met by people that they knew from their earthly life. And eventually, each character is given a choice of whether they'll stay or whether they'll get back on the bus. Now, that sounds like an easy choice. You'd think it would be an easy choice. But it's, it's not as easy as, as you might imagine. For instance, one woman sees people in heaven that she thought were beneath her that she knew from her previous life, and she'd always felt like she was better than them and better than a whole lot of people. And so instead of joining them in eternal life with God, she says, if that's what heaven is going to look like, I don't want any part of it. She gets back on the bus. Another man is met there by his brother and by his brother's murderer. And, uh, and even, in, even in death, this man is still mad about it. The, the, the brother and the brother's murderer assure him everything is different now in heaven. That there's been reconciliation, that there's love and there's joy, and that he can be a part of that. But he's not ready to forgive and he's not ready to let go of his anger. So he gets back on the bus. If memory serves me, I think only one person that takes that trip was willing to make the changes necessary in order to stay. Only one was willing to change. The rest preferred the hell they knew to the reality of eternal life with God. Ever since I read that book, I've, I've wondered about how our life in this world either prepares us for heaven, which is an eternity with God, or for hell, which of course is the opposite of that, whatever it looks like. Another way of bringing that home for us today is to ask the question, are we investing in things that truly are eternal, or are we getting caught up in a whole lot of stuff that really doesn't matter? Life in this world is short. Clear back at the beginning of our sermon series on eternity, we started off with Psalm 91, in which the psalmist asks God to help him to number his days. And the idea behind that is that the more we recognize how, how short our time in this world really is, the more we'll value it, the more we'll see how precious and sacred it is. Now, with this idea that life is eternal, I want you to imagine that you're looking back at your life in this world from, let's say, 100,000 years in the future. 
Now, I'm guessing that from that distance and from that perspective, these fleeting moments we have now will seem infinitely more valuable because this, these are the moments that we have to do the right thing. This is the moment when we love. This is the moment when we forgive. This is the moment when we grow in holiness, in goodness, in our relationship with God. This is the moment to begin living in a way that will prepare us for heaven so that we'll fit in heaven instead of being more maybe appropriate for a bus ride to that other place. Today we're going to turn to the next to the last chapter of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, to see how the story of creation ends and how God's eternal story begins. And I should point out that the book of Revelation is probably one of the most misrepresented books in the Bible. People think it's scary and it's ominous because it does describe some of the horrors of this world, some of the evil that flourishes in this world. It did at the time of the early church, it still does today. But John tells those stories so that he can tell the even more important story that God's love ultimately prevails, just like Janelle said in in our children's message today, Revelation assures us that God will be victorious and that evil in all of its, its forms will be completely defeated. If there is, if there ever was a happy ending for a book, the Bible has one. When, whenever I, I meet with people who are preparing for baptism, I always, I always try to make sure they understand this. Uh, I explain how the Bible begins basically with perfection, with God walking with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. There's perfect intimacy uh, in this, perfect intimacy between God and the human beings and between the man and, and the woman, but that falls apart really, really fast. By, the end, by, by chapter 3, Cain has already murdered his brother Abel and has lied to God about it. So we see very clearly that the Bible doesn't sugarcoat the truth about who we are or the world that we live in. But the other thing that I share with, with folks that are preparing for baptism is that, that in the same way the Bible begins with perfection and with perfect intimacy and reconciliation, it ends in the same way. The whole, that's really the whole goal of the Bible. The whole purpose of God's story is to be reconciled with His creation and with His children. The book of Revelation then is, is this beautiful poetic description of what that perfect world is going to look like. So we're, uh, the, the primary difference between the, the beginning and the end is that in John's vision, it's not a garden, but a city, a place where countless people will live in communion with God and with each other. And we read about that vision in Revelation 21, beginning at verse 1. We're going to read through verse 4, then we're going to jump to verse 22. And you can follow along with me at home in your own Bibles if you'd like. John writes, then I saw a new heaven and a new new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, see, the home of God is among mortals. He will dwell with them and they will be his peoples and God himself will be with them. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death will be no more. Mourning and crying and pain will be no more for the first things have passed away. I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty and the Lamb. And the city has no need of sun or moon to shine on it for the glory of God is its light and its lamp is the Lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day, and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations, but nothing unclean will enter it, nor anyone who practices abomination or falsehood, but only those who are written in the Lamb's book of life. For me, this is one of the most beautiful and hopeful passages in the whole Bible. To know that evil is defeated and that God's goodness and love will reign for eternity is awesome. To know that we get to be a part of that is awesome. But it still leaves one big question 
what about now? What do we do in the meantime? Fortunately, Jesus' entire ministry was basically dedicated to answering that question. Jesus' first sermon was really simple. He said, the kingdom of God has drawn near. Some, some versions it says, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, turn your life in the direction of God and believe in the good news. Enter into that kingdom. Jesus wanted us to understand that we are citizens, first and foremost, of God's kingdom. Or as Paul says in Philippians 3.20, our citizenship is in heaven and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. What that tells me is that my ultimate loyalty is not to a king, it's not to a nation, it's not to a political party or an ideology or to anything else. It is to God and to God's kingdom. We've been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ, through His life, death, and resurrection. And we do await His final return. But for now, we are called to be representatives of God's kingdom and ministers of His love and reconciliation. In other words, we invest ourselves not in things that are transient, not in things of this world, but in things that are eternal. I find myself going back again and again to Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount where He says, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven. In other words, if you invest so much in this world with its hyperpartisan politics and its greed and its selfishness and its racism and its violence and, and all of that, what are you going to have to show for it when God's kingdom is fully here? When that kingdom of peace and unity and love are complete? I hate to break this to you, but if you've invested yourself only in this world, there may not be a place for you in the next. That's, that's what it says. So once again, what does that mean for how we should be living today? Well, it doesn't mean giving up and waiting for the end to come so that we can be carried off out of the world. I think sometimes people approach it that way. This world is evil. I'm just waiting to get out of here. That's not what Jesus says. As disappointed as we might sometimes be in this world, Jesus says very clearly in John 3, 16, everybody knows this, for God so loved the world, this world. That means that we are to continue living in this world that God loves as citizens of God's kingdom and as agents of His love and reconciliation. Jesus basically said, the kingdom of God is at hand, now live like it. Live like members, like citizens of the kingdom. It's not fully present yet, which of course is going to be obvious to anybody that's paying attention. But here's the thing. The kingdom can be present in you. Whenever you love, whenever you sacrifice, whenever you seek to understand, whenever you forgive, whenever you advocate for the poor or work for justice, whenever you tell the story of the tortured, dying Messiah who lived and died so that we might be saved, so that we might have life, the kingdom is at hand. On Monday of this week, I, I received a historical care package from the man who installed the, the pipe organ in the original church down on Blondo in 1968. He also then was there to move it to the new location here in this sanctuary in 2005, and I met him last week as he was here working on it again. Uh, so he's been in this business a long time, and his sons are going to be taking it over for him. So out of the blue, he sent me, after our conversation, he sent me a file that he had kept with everything related to our church. It had a picture of the original installation, multiple copies of, of letters that had gone back and forth between the church and him, and a copy of the bulletin from the Sunday in 1968 when the, the original organ was dedicated. And I noticed that, that date right away. And it's probably a, a year, that date is, uh, is one that you've probably heard talked about recently because it was another year in which our country saw protests and rioting similar to what we've been seeing now and, and for the same reasons. On the back of that, of that bulletin was a meditation for the week of prayer for Christian unity. 
And there was one line that really stood out for me, especially in the light of everything I've been thinking about this week uh, as I've been studying Revelation 21. And, uh, and so I'm going to show you a picture of it and read it. This is, this is the little paragraph that jumped out at me. The Lord whose return we await came into this world out of love. The knowledge that God will fully manifest God's glory in the future does not deliver us from responsibility for the present. Rather, it is through our present acts for the world that we proclaim our faith in the future revelation of God's glory. Which is basically a fancy way of saying that the fact that the kingdom, God's kingdom, will be fully present someday does not mean that we don't have responsibility for living as citizens of God's kingdom right now. We can pray, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, and, and, and we should. But until that time comes, we must never forget that the kingdom of God is already at hand. So let's live and think and speak and act like we belong here. And all God's people said, Amen. Last week, we remembered the gift of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit was poured out on the first disciples and they spoke in other languages. And you may remember that one of the, one of the really miracles of that day was that there were people gathered in Jerusalem for that, that Jewish festival of Passover that, uh, that spoke all these different languages and suddenly they could understand the message of God's story as it was being proclaimed. It was a, it was a miracle of unity and, uh, and power. Today, we read a vision of what the world, what, what our eternal story is going to look like. It's going to be a, a place where we can dwell with one another, all nations, all races, all languages, all people everywhere, living in love and unity, living in peace. And of course, as I've been saying, we're not there yet. The kingdom is at hand in us, but it's not fully present yet in the world. Here at this table, I think we get a foretaste of it. Here at this table, all barriers fall down. All borders, flags mean nothing here at this table. Borders mean nothing at this table. Because when we share the bread and the cup, we are united with the citizens of the kingdom Everywhere. That's who we are. And so this table is a foretaste of that, that table around which we will gather someday as the saints in heaven, as we gather in white robes, all of us that have been washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so as we gather here at this table, we remember how on the night Jesus was betrayed. The night before he was executed by the state. We remember how he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to them and said, this is my body given for you. We remember how he took a cup and after giving thanks, gave it to them also and said, this cup is a new covenant in my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it always in remembrance of me.
Our tech guys tell me that, uh, that we've got audio only and no video, so I know you're hearing me right now, and I uh, want to thank you for joining us for our 11 o'clock uh, contemporary service, and uh, hope that you'll join us again next week. Uh, one, one little bit of uh, exciting news that we have, we're, we're hoping to have uh, something available in the parking lot next week. We've got a, a FM, low power FM transmitter and we tested it today. It works. So, uh, so stay tuned for more information about what we'll be doing with that next week. Uh, we understand that it, it goes quite a, quite a distance. So we're excited about that. Uh, and so we just pray that you'll have a great week, uh, that you will live in the power of God's love, and that you'll be a representative and a citizen of God's kingdom even now in this world. Thank you again for joining us. Uh, we're going to go out with one final song uh, as we worship together today.
Thank you, everyone, for joining us. God bless you this week. We'll see you next week.